All right, as we, as I put out to everybody, today's topic is uh, the new Honeywell Web's Cyper Model 50, also known as the Eagle Hawk NX. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest because we've got a lot more people online today than we have on previous topics. Um, I made up a slide deck, which I'm trying to, I want to use as a, uh, um, cheat sheet also for when you're setting them up. This isn't just for doing presentations with the product, but it's also capturing things that you need to do or things to not do uh, when you're working with the controller. Uh, I also have our sitting on the bench, and I took one of our little D-Link cameras to be able to at least show live what the display does. I think that's the biggest thing. And then you have the LEDs we'll be showing. Um, as well as we'll go live into the controller through uh, through Niagara as well. The, uh, the Cyper Model 50 is from Central Line Honeywell in Germany. Um, you'll see the picture on my on the first slide there it says Central Line by Honeywell on it. For the actual product that we have, it's Honeywell. But Central Line is the company that has developed this. It's the same basic physical size and I.O. as the uh, Eagle AX had, uh, but that model with the hardware that was on, it couldn't go past Niagara AX. So they uh, released the uh, Eagle Hawk, which is a Niagara 4 based product. Uh, first, I thought I'd go through a little overview. Um, one of the first things I want to point out, or one I said it's built on Niagara 4, um, it is only supported on this one build that I have listed here, 4.4.93.40.8. It's a specific build for that. You can't go to 5.6 with it. You have to stay with this until they come out with the newer versions with the uh, uh, built for this product. Um, if you download this version from our BP Tech Center or from Buildings Forum, all the modules required are built into it. Actually, they, this build finally was correct about, uh, I don't know, it was end of last week, I guess, because uh, they had some older um, modules that were in there that didn't give you all the components that you needed um, when you were working with the controller. The, the controller out of the box includes LawnWorks, BACnet MSTP, BACnet IP, SNMP, um, and it's also licensed for the spider controller, so for the spider tools. So you'll be able to uh, integrate and work with uh, spider controllers with this product as well. It also has a software maintenance agreement for the life of Niagara 4.x. So as long as they're releasing updates to, to Niagara 4, this will, the license will automatically be upgraded to the latest version. Um, so then once, if they're, well, someday a Niagara 5 will come out or whatever they're going to decide to call it, it wouldn't be license for that, it would be a license upgrade if the product could even, you know, work with that platform. You know, that's too far in the future, you really can't tell at this point. But it's unlike the 8000 where you have a software maintenance agreement that you have to pay for to keep it, keep it up to date. Uh, this is included when you purchase the product. It has an optional, uh, you have two options, one with the display and one without, and they have an external handheld display or panel mount that you can use with it. Uh, on board, it has 26 points of I.O., 10 universal inputs, four digital ends, four analog outputs, and eight digital outputs. And I do have a slide that goes into the characteristics of the, uh, of the I.O. and what you can do with them. The base license that is included with the controller uh, includes 100 points that uh, work with the, it, with uh, the onboard I.O., LAN, BACnet, Modbus, so that's the global points in the license. So any physical I.O. that you attach to this controller. Uh, and it's licensed for five devices, itself for its onboard I.O. and four additional devices. So whether that's um, doing the panel bus I.O., doing, uh, you know, a LAN device, a BACnet device. And it's expandable up to 2,500 points, physical points. So obviously the design of this is a plant controller, a large 
you know, large controller. It has two RS-45 ports, one optically isolated on port one. Port two um, is non-isolated, but there are two RS-45 ports built in. Uh, you have the ability to use panel bus I.O. expansion that comes from the XL5000, the XL500, XL800 controllers. So that has uh, the ability to work with those modules. You can have up to 64 panel bus modules on one RS-45 port. So you can have a max of, of 128 on the controller. Supports Niagara Logic, you know, kick control, you know, like a Jace would. It also supports the central line macro library which are uh, canned applications and components that go along with what was done in CARE to some extent, plus other HVAC logic blocks that uh, can be used. And that actually is a library that can be used on any web's JACE. Um, they made the change when they first came out with the Eagle AX, they were only licensed for the Eagle and they've changed since changed that and a web's JACE could even use those modules if need be. It has two uh, two ports switch built into it, yeah, and it's a. Everybody could mute themselves. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it has, like I said, two Ethernet ports uh, built in, and we'll be able, we'll go through a slide on what you can do with those two ports as far as being a switch or being a it being individual uh, separated ports. Okay. It supports daisy chain networking, and you can do a loop, and a uh, rapid spanning tree protocol is what's being used for that. Mail carrier find out why he kept returning my stuff, and then he says, well, he doesn't live there, and they're like, yes, he does, and they apologize, and that's okay. Okay. So on that base license, as I mentioned, it has the uh, software maintenance agreement for life of Niagara 4. It has the standard uh, BACnet, LAN, and Modbus uh, drivers as well as SNMP, and also has the spider tool feature built into it. Uh, the 100 global points for five devices, and, and one of those devices is the controller itself, and it can be expanded for up to 2,500 points. Some of the part numbers that are available for the controller, you have, as I mentioned, the Eagle without display, the Eagle with display, then you have the external display part number, but then you also have license upgrades, so you can expand the controller. Uh, you have a license upgrade if you wanted to add 255 points, then you could have, you could add one device and 50 points, or then it picks up from where the JS8000 or the Web8000 has its uh, device upgrades. So you can add 10, 25, and 50 pack of, of devices and points to the, uh, to the Eagle. And as I mentioned, it's up to 2,500 points. So that's a pretty big controller. Sure. Also, there's, an, uh, there's a uh, USB port that allows you to put a LAN adapter on there. This isn't the USB LAN stick that we use with our laptops. This is an, actually a separate uh, device. It's an IF LON2, and I have, a, I have a slide, a picture showing what that device is. But uh, it plugs into the controller and allows you to do uh, FT10 LON works. The onboard I.O., it's the universal inputs are capable of doing uh, NTC 10K. Now, Nowhere in any documentation anywhere, including in Germany, is there anything that says if it's type 2 or type 3 10K. I reached out to Web Squad, and they came back and said they're pretty sure it's 10K type 3. That's as, as firm of an answer as I got. They were going to go back and verify it. Now, I have a 20K NTC sensor, and I have a, a 10K type 3 sensor sitting here on the controller, and they're within a few tenths of each other, so I tend to believe it's a 10K type 3, but I think in that temperature range, 10, type 2 and type 3 isn't that far off each other anyway. Um, but okay. if I hear anything different, I'll make sure I let everybody know. The uh, analog outputs have a max of 1 milliamp. 
uh, 0 to 11 volts. The binary outputs, you get three different flavors. You've got a, you've got four three amp relays. You have one that's a 10 amp relay and it's, it can handle a high inrush of, of uh, current. And then there's also, and those first, let's see, all but binary output three have, um, let me think about this. No, the first three have a common uh, terminal. You'll see in the bottom left, I added a screenshot of it, that uh, binary output one, two, and three, one, two, and three share a common. The rest have their own common. So they are they're separate, unique dry contacts on the relays. And the big thing is that the uh, uh, binary output four is a 10 amp relay. And also, if you look at this, they're actually rated for 250 volts AC as well. I don't know if I would actually put be switching line voltage in there anyway, but in, I guess in Europe they do. One of the things usually you get questions on is how the outputs behave when the controller is starting up or during a download. And I found a, uh, a document in Germany that had some details on, on this, among some other things. So I just pulled that and put it in here. Um, the outputs on the on panel bus, on panel I.O. modules, the panel bus, they uh, will go to a safety position after a receive heartbeat expires. Um, this is during a download. And um, the outputs on the Lineworks I.O. modules uh, same thing with the receive heartbeat. When they expire, they go to a fail-safe position. So you have a safety position that you determine that you set up for them. The onboard I/O also have a safety position associated with them. So when there's a timeout, uh, it'll go to a known position. Uh, in the upper left, you can see the FT10 LON adapter, the DIN rail mountable. And it's a micro USB cable that actually plugs into the edge. You can see where I show the uh, the controller. There's a micro USB. There's a USB connector here that is used. That's dedicated for the lawn cart. And you'll see the one on the left is with the display. The one on the right does not have a display. And then there's a dedicated uh, Ethernet port and dedicated uh, RJ45 for the external display. Oops. So you can have go either way with that. As I mentioned, the uh, the controller has two Ethernet ports on it, and there's two different modes that you can work with on this. There's a switch mode, switching switching mode, which is like a standard Ethernet switch. So when you Uh, let's see. So when if you want it as a switch, you disable the second Ethernet port, and then it automatically becomes a two-port switch. Once you enable the second port and you have both ports enabled, you would set them up on their own subnet, and they would work just like a JACE does right now where they're, uh, they're separate networks. Um, I have listed there the uh, default out-of-box uh, IP addressing of the uh, of the um, Eagle. So you'll see port one is 192.168.200.20 and port two is 201.20. And the third way they show there really it's two ways for a Jace or for the Eagle, but you could have your controllers daisy chain through and then maybe have the first one have it set up as separate network so that you could have a dedicated port to go to a building network and then have the second port be like a sub-network to the rest of your um, Eagle Hawks or Jaces or whatever else you might have on that network. Then there's also a third Ethernet port on the Eagle Hawk. Uh, on the face of the controller, there is a USB cable, and it's a USB 2 port. You can plug in with the standard USB cable to your PC and it becomes a Ethernet port. Now I have Windows 10 on my machine 
and just plugging it in, it was automatically set up. I didn't have to add any drivers, do any configuration whatsoever. Um, the Jace on this port, or the Jace, sorry, the Eagle Hawk on this port is 192.168.255.241. You cannot change this. You cannot disable it. It's a, it's a dedicated port, and uh, it's always there, able to be used. Um, on your PC, your PC will automatically get its addressing from that. It's a DHCP built in. And if I remember correctly on my machine, it just made it uh, .242 for my PC on that port. So you don't need to have an Ethernet connection on your computer. As long as you have your USB 2 cable uh, connection, you can connect to this controller. Now, some of the things I did find in the documentation was that um, if you have multiple, um, multiple Eagle Hawks connected to one transformer, you have to watch the polarity of your power. Otherwise, if you're going to connect over the USB cable, there's a chance that you could have a, a, a short in there and uh, take out a port. Sort of reminds me of days with, uh, what was it, the XL500 when we were doing the, uh, what was it, the B port, where we used to have to use the optically isolated adapters in between. So as long as you, you have your polarity set the same, you should be okay. I mean, really, it's, it's recommended that you have a dedicated transformer or power supply for each, for each uh, Eagle Hawk. Um, they do take 24 volts AC or 24 volts DC. I'm actually using a DC power, support, power supply right now on this one. Are there any questions so far? Do you, Frank, do you have to um, use the uh, FT10 adapter for mine? That's the only adapter available for this, yes. You can't use your USB okay. stick. Okay, so when you go online, you, you, you're adding the FT10 adapter to it, okay. Yes. Uh, Frank, if I use that FT10 adapter, can I put that on a line that works? Oh, boy, something's, somebody's got some feedback. Um, Got to figure out who it is. Nope. Um, <laughs> there we go. All right, somebody jumped out or something. There you go. <laughs> Could you repeat that question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so if I use the FT10 adapter, can I put that on an existing lawn network and program and use the controller, but just bring it in to my another Jace over lawn, or is that just to bring controllers into it? I would think as long as you have your your uh, node number unique on the network. I, I haven't looked at the lawn side. I don't have a lawn adapter to do any playing with it. I mean, I imagine it's going to be, what do they usually set them for, uh, two, what, what's the, one, 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 two, 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 but you would, I mean, I would think you could do it that way. I haven't done any testing. I haven't seen any information on it yet. I mean, because in that regard, this is still a Niagara device like a Jace is. Welcome to WebEx. Enter your access code or meeting number followed by pound. So that's an interesting question. What lawn points would show up? If you stuck Enter your attendee ID number lawn. followed by pound. If you do not know your attending number, press pound to continue. Would you have to All right. Yeah, now you're good. I think I muted the right one. That's still muted? Okay. Everybody still there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that is a really good question. Uh, I would expect, being that it is a Niagara device like a Jace, that uh, the rules would be the same. I have not seen any information, any literature yet that talks about the lawn part of this yet, and nor do I have one to test to see. I would expect it would be 
like I said, similar to what you would have in a standard JACE? Well, it's going to have to behave. Um, it, it's going to have to, like, if, I think it was intended to be used as to bring things into bring it. things into it, not right. to have right. ne necessarily. So you yeah, have my, to create NVOs is, in order for them right. to be exposed. But exactly. the other, but the other part of that though is, if this is a plant controller, this isn't really going to be adjacent. It could be a plant controller into another lawn system or, or back net system. Right. As, soon as, you, as long as you create those NVOs to push back out onto the lawn network. I think it right. You would have to have those lawn objects work. created. Absolutely. Right. Right. Um, Ethernet wise, you could connect it to a Niagara network. Yeah. But I think that right. the lawn intended to be used as an integration tool to bring other things Just into I, it. I have a lot of existing jobs that are big lawn networks that I could use one of these in, but we haven't yet because we're there's no Ethernet available anywhere where we could use it. We're kind of scared to right. take that jump, like I was just talking about. But well, I'm going to be I'll getting a lawn. Shot. I'm going to be getting a lawn adapter. I mean, it's something we can do some testing with as well. But we can also, I can reach out to Web Squad to see if they have any, any more information. They're still working on their user guide for this thing. I've been working off of one that I got from Mike Hines a month ago or so, and I found the uh, Germany one that I've been pulling more of my information from than, than I have anything else. Um, but you would think if this is being touted as a plant controller, it should be able to go on an existing system, just like if you put it on an existing BACnet system. Granted, you'd have to do your export table and all to make it a BACnet server, but right. you would expect that it should be capable as long as you follow the rules and you know your, your uh, domain and your you know, subnet and node numbers and all that. But uh, I'll get more information on that. All right, cool. that's a Thank very you. good question. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, panel bus on the Eagle Hawk. As I mentioned, you can have 128 panel bus I/O modules per controller, 64 per 485 port. And then you can have a maximum of 16 I.O. modules per each of the types. Um, and it's just showing a couple examples of mixing and matching those modules. Um, but if you go through here, I mean, I'm familiar with an 821 would be a universal input or analog input card. This is your digital input card. Digital output card is the 824. 823 would be a digital input. I don't know off the top of my head what the 30 or 31 is. I really haven't used much of the I.O. But these are not the the eight series. I think they are, but they're well different part numbers. I pulled these from that's probably my mistake. I pulled these from that other user manual because it had that information. The CL is is central line. So this is probably the Germany version of the part numbers. I will update this once they have it, but it's going to be so when the standard panel I.O., so the, eight, eight, the 821s, the 22, 22 23, 23, 24, right. So that, that work with the XL800. Right. That's the and also the mixed I.O. modules as well. Yeah. Not to make anything confusing. Right. <laughs> and one of the things I found, too, and I'm hoping they keep it on the Americanized um, user manual, this is one of the ones I found in the Germany one um, where they did some performance testing to show, you know, CPU usage of the, of the controller um, and then, the, you know, pull rates and things like that. So I just threw this one here just as reference material. But it looks like they've tested, you know, they, they, they tested, uh, here's one of the first line there is 46 modules with 491 points. And the second bus, they also then had 559 points on there. So they had quite a few points that they were testing against. And I mean, CPU usage is only at 30%. That's, that's pretty good. <clears throat> and then on the, the, the Niagara uh, workbench side, um, I made a list of the modules that are available for it, 
and also what the current version numbers are. This, this is the list of version numbers that, uh, the versions that came out with this latest build that um, Paul at WebSquat put up on Buildings Forum on, I think it was Friday morning. The mandatory one, ones you'd need are the, the CL onboard I.O. and then the, uh, the Honeywell Eagle Hawk modules for, the, uh, for your display. They're the main modules that are, uh, that are required. And then we'll go through what's in those modules in, in, uh, in Workbench. So still this and new it, version doesn't support the Niagara 4.3? It only works with this version that I had listed, 4.4.93. Whatever that was on that first page. Okay. You cannot use so it anything, and it won't be. They will not have it backported either. I can't imagine they they were going to start with this and work forward with new versions. Okay, but it should work with the latest 4.6, right? No, you can only. Well, the supervisor can be at that level, but this device has to be commissioned with 4.4.93.40.8. Okay. And it's this document, the, the slides that I have here, will be a PDF on our BP Tech Center as well in the Tech Tuesday section. So in addition to the, video, the recording of this, um, I will have that document. And as we move forward and get more information, uh, and more testing and, and you know, web squads input, I'll be adding more to this document as well. So it'll be more of a, a user um, manual ne than necessarily a, uh, a presentation type thing. Just figuring it's one place to put everything as we move forward. Another big, actually this was uh, one of our customers, uh, one of our partners, I guess, in the last couple of weeks, working with their, um, their Eagle Hawk before, I, before we had gotten ours, so I haven't had any playtime with it. And I uh, couldn't figure out why they weren't able to use the browser to access the, uh, their HTML5 uh, PX pages. Uh, they wouldn't, nothing would come up. As part of the added built-in cybersecurity of what they're doing with Niagara, you cannot uh, set the HTTP ports or HTTPS ports up in this controller for a range. Anything below 1024 will not work. So port 80 won't do anything for you. Port 443 will not work as well. They're the defaults because you're using a standard Niagara station when you first build this. It has to be above 1024. They were saying in a document that it has to be 8080 and 8443. I think it's more than that. It just has to be above 1024. I haven't tested it to see that it, if it, whether it had to be those two, but you can use a port number below 1024. So that's something to keep in mind. And you may want to do is come up with a template, you know, a save, you know, come up with a base station for the Eagle Hawk, make all these types of changes, and then save it, and that's what you start with, you know, on each job. That's why you don't forget so, that to, to make this kind of change. So, Frank, so this doesn't have a uh, email service? It has all that. This is this is for that's, the that's this, outgoing. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an outgoing port. This is more for the HTTP HTTPS access. This is, okay. This is for the like okay. servers that are running. Got it. And then we move on to the. HMI operators terminal that's built in or external. Um, this is more of a steps on how to set it up. Um, just a little background on the display. The display, you can set up your own menuing, your own points within the menuing. Uh, you can access alarms. You can, you can um, acknowledge your alarms. You can make custom point groups. It has an all points. Um, display in there. It has a points and alarm, points and override. Uh, like I said, you can customize it however you see fit. Uh, it does full scheduling, so your standard Niagara schedules you can bring up. And actually, that's the part I really like on here. And very easy to work with. And I'll show you that on the, the live controller. Um, you actually can go in there and edit your schedules from that display. And 
in addition to the built-in display, there's also the LEDs that are built into the controller itself. Um, and I have a little screenshot showing there. There's a uh, alarm LED that's controlled by a uh, LED recipient for your alarm service for this product. So that if an alarm comes in and it's not acknowledged, that little red LED uh, with it with, shown with the triangle with the exclamation point, um, it will blink red until you acknowledge the alarm and the alarm goes away and that will go out again. So you have control over that LED. So you can just at a glance at the controller know if you have any alarms in the system. So on the HMI display, it's simple to set up. There's a um, HMI service that you add. It's a, uh, um, it's a Hun Eagle Hawk HMI service that you put under the services. Um, part of your station. And from within there, there's a PIN number that you must set up. So that's your password to get into the display. And you can have an auto log. There's an auto log off period that you set. Um, there's also a um, disclaimer slot in there that you have to scroll through on the display to accept before you can move on and look at any points. The one that they had built in is like pages long that you get to scroll through. Well, you can delete that and you can not have it or you can put your own text in there if you want to. Um, but then once you set your pin for it, the next thing you do is when you add that service, you're going to find there's a new role in the uh, role service and it's called uh, NO admin role. And you go there to set the role that you want, the permissions that you want for, uh, for users for their access. Then you would add a HMI alarm recipient to the uh, alarm service. So this way, when an alarm comes in, the display knows to be able to pull from that uh, to be able to show points in alarm. And then there's also, as I mentioned, the LED recipient that controls the, uh, the alarm LED built into the uh, controller. So with those pieces in there, with those, well, in the palette, you then can build your own menus. You know, you can just drag and drop points that you want to display in each of the, each of the folders, if you want to call them that, that are, that are in there. So you can make it fully custom or you can just use their their menuing that's there with the, uh, you know, all points, points and override, that sort of thing. The other thing you can do with this display, you can go in, you can put points in manual, so you can override your points as well using the display. And I think once you start playing with it, I'm not sure, I, I honestly have no idea what the pricing is on these different models and the two models of Eagle Hawk. Um, I don't know what the price difference is on having a display or not, but I think once you start playing with the display, it's it's a nice little handy tool to have, especially if you're going to be doing a large plant controller. It's nice having a display built in to be able to go in and interrogate the system, overwrite things, see what's an alarm, acknowledge alarms, or whatever. Any questions on that? I guess that was my last. Yeah, that was the last part of that, so now we can actually go live anyway. Um, that is the, the Eagle Hawk. As you can see on here, I've got the, in the front, up in, the, there's, there's your USB in the, uh, the face of it, and that's the USB cable that I have plugged into my computer. Uh, and I'm using that as my Ethernet port to uh, communicate with the, uh, with the controller. The terminal strips are all removable. These are all the, I guess you call them POCOM connections where you got to push in the post. It opens up when you pop your cable in. Um, I haven't looked to see, but I'm wondering if they have a, a model that are actual screw terminals. That I don't know. It would be nice if they did. Because 
One of the things you'll find on here too, I'm going to point out that there are one, two, there's a third ground somewhere else and down here on the analog output. Those three grounds are tied together. They're the only reference grounds for your I.O., for your, uh, your inputs and your analog outputs. So I would expect, and especially being the POCOM type, and even if they're a screw terminal type, you can't get much more than a couple of wires under there. You're going to be taking a ground out to a terminal strip, I would think, to be able to, uh, to land all your wires on this controller. I don't know if anybody, I know the Eagle AX was the same way, so if anybody out there has worked with those controllers and has any input on how they were doing their wiring, it'd be great to hear from you. Hey, Jim, how about you? Hey, Frank. Yeah. yeah. So they make a uh, little expansion thing you clip onto the bottom of the Eagle AX, that's why there's slots on it. And it lets you take that uh, ground terminal, put it on, and it turns it, I think, into eight ground terminals. This is when you say that, you mean the back of it? On the top of it, it slides into little clips. Um, I'd have to look up the part number, but um, we used them on the on the AX version. Let's see, it's slotted up here for some. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's, there's little slots cut in right behind. Yeah. There's one there you up go. There, Those right? gray slots. Yep. It's here. It's here. They make terminal strips that clip into them, and you just take okay. a jumper from that to your ground. Good to know. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now that terminal strip's probably you know four hundred dollars. So we would probably take this device and wire every screw terminal out to a terminal block. If we were making, to make it convenient for in the field wiring, yeah, and make it a lot neater of a of an installation. Uh, while we're going through this, you'll see on the top part you have your two Ethernet ports. There's your USB for the uh, LAN adapter. Um, what else have we got up there? We've got another. Looks like an RJ45 connection and a. Three position switch. That's for your your uh, safety chain versus different network. No, that's done strictly in software. Mm -hmm. I will have to think. I I honestly haven't seen anything. Huh? Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. The RS. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. The. RJ45 in the back, and as it says on the front there, plain English, RS232 is your uh, RJ45, and the the uh, switch settings. I thought that at first, but I would have assumed there would have been two sets since there's two RS45 ports. But it is the biasing for the RS485 port one, and that is the non that is the optically isolated port. So that's the port that they built in the biasing, like the 8000 has, but has for both ports. So the biasing is included for just the uh, just the one port. The let's see what else on the on the display, the way it's set up, and I'm hoping I can be easier if I go in. I think a little closer on the display. The the round button is actually a button press button, and also for scrolling. So if I go back to home and I say I want to go into this fast access list, I can scroll down to admin, press the button again, and I just have this set for one, two, three, four, five. And I'm going to change it to all ones because that'd be a lot easier. Come on. Okay, so it's a little temperament. And this is where I was talking about the the little uh, paragraph of information you have to scroll through and then say confirm. You can change that text to whatever you want. Uh, what's showing here is that we have, and as the um, as the, LED, the red 
alarm LED stated or is showing, it has alarms in here. So I could go in here to this one here, to this alarm, and it scrolls through, especially because the, usually the words are pretty long, so you can't see everything. So at least it scrolls through so you can read it as it goes across. Then if you scroll all the way down, there should be an acknowledge at the bottom. There it is. I can say acknowledge. Do the same on this one. And once these get acknowledged, the alarm LED should turn off as well. And it is no longer blinking, it's turned off, so that did work. So if we go back to the beginning, we could go in. There's your alarms, points and alarm. You could have your own alarm list if you wanted. Um, the general tab, you can look at points in manual, station point list, controller settings, controller information. So we could go in here and date and time. You can do it on. Uh, look at have, have to be Niagara points that are loaded in the. They must be right. Yeah, this is that. That part's all. Yeah, it's all Niagara at that point. So a long point, for example, would have to be made into a Niagara point to right, show you, up. You proxy, po proxy points, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you bring it in, it becomes a Niagara point. Right. Proxy. So I made up a uh, fast, I added some points to the fast access list, and there's my uh, space temp. And I noticed today they're over three degrees off, so we'll get clarification from uh, Hopefully, Web Squad will get firm information on that 10K, whether it's really Type 2 or Type 3. Or just stick with 20K. Yeah, or, yeah, just stick with 20K. That's right. Um, I have listed in this point access list my Boolean schedule as well. And just by pressing the button, I can get into it. And Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever day I want to go into, I can go in here and say I want to change it. I can change my start time if I wanted. It's really cool. And they, they really did a nice job with this. Access to the properties of the scroll wheel. It, no, it'd be nice if the scroll wheel was had a clip to it. Well, it does. No, 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 no. I don't. Oh, you mean the spinning? I mean the spinning. Yeah, there is there is a click to it, but it doesn't correspond to anything. Yeah. You can see that it's. So, like I said, they did a nice job with the uh, with the scheduling piece. Yeah, like I said, you can you know put points in manual. I could come in here and make that alarm point. Yeah, display is really for standalone or an operator in a mechanical room that right. doesn't have a terminal. You know, our technicians, our guys that are installing it, they're going to use their laptop. Right. But if you got a little standalone system, maybe this is doing a little VVT with three zones. You want a panel mount of this? You could have, right. you could have the, VAV, the, the VVT controllers come into here and actually have all that right on the display. It would be Niagara networked over, or well, depending on what it is, it could be, you know, if it's LON or BACnet, points would be in here and you'd be able to uh, show them on the same display. I think there's a lot you can do with that. And you can change your, your pin in here. So I just wanted to show how that worked, what was there. Um, now what we can do is actually go into the uh, workbench tool and, and see what's going on in there. Um, as I mentioned, well, and what I'm doing here is I'm working with through the USB port. So I'm connecting to 192.168.255.241 on the, on the um, Eagle Hawk. If you stay with the standard, you go in with the Ethernet port, like I said, their number was 1.241 was the, was the uh, default. I'm sorry, no, the default was 200.20, and 201.20 was the secondary one. I had changed the uh, Ethernet port settings for our network here. 
if I just go into the platform, .20 and 201.20. As I mentioned, you know, it's 4.4.93.40. And if we go back, let's see, we can go into. I just named it generic station, CIP50 station. We look at the station itself. As I mentioned, one of the things we add is that uh, the HON Eagle Hawk HMI service. And that is part of the HON Eagle Hawk HMI. So if you open up this palette, that um, service is in there. When you drop it in, You have that safety warning, that, that, that paragraph of information that came up. We can just turn around and just remove that if you want. Um, and then you can put a welcome message in there as well. The other piece that you add is on the alarm service. You have your standard console recipient. You add an HMI alarm console recipient which again is out of that Eagle, Eagle Hawk HMI palette. And go there, I just wanna go in and basically the same setup you have on a, uh, a normal console recipient. Then you have also the LED recipient. The LED recipient for whatever reason I guess it's because it's on board, it's not part of the HMI itself. And the on board IO um, is the LED recipient. You drop that on there, so anytime you have an alarm, that LED would turn on. But as you can see, it's connected to an alarm class, so you can make it as, be as creative as you want. You may only want certain critical points to make that LED come on. And as a console recipient, you can go and look at the alarm console from here as well. But this is what comes up then on the display. Under the, uh, the Eagle Hawk HMI service, you have this home. Actually, I added this last line here, but these are the default menu items that are, are folders that are listed that are in the display. Um, there's a fast access list. What you do here is if you have points to put in there, you would just you can either do an add object and and find it through your select ord box or you could come down here and you know let's say we had I, mean, I already have these points in there but I could come over here and drop a point in that way. And granted, like I said it's already there so it's not going to do it. And then you can move the points around in the list too so that they show up. You may have a, you may have to scroll through. You may have so many points on there, it's two or three pages long. So you want to put the more important points at the top of the list. So it gives you the ability to move them up and the up and down from this display. The alarm section, there's a built-in points and alarm list. And then there's a separate alarm list. If you wanted specific alarm points to, to be put in there, you could do that as well. The general tab or general selection, um, the points in manual, you could come over here and you can choose. You know, that they, it was built by choosing 
the you know all points points and alarm are overridden points. So that's overridden points. You have station points list, which is an all points list. Um, your controller setting is a standard one that's in there, as well as the controller information. If you don't want that accessible by a user using the display, you can just delete these. This is just a starting point. Doesn't mean they have to be in there. So it's fully flexible in, in how you set it up. Unlike the, I mean, the, the look and feel of the display is like an XI582 and an XL500-800 environment. It's more flexibility in what you display on there. You know, so you could add your own. Like I added a, a menu item called analog inputs, and it has this fast access list, and you can you go there and you can then copy and paste or just drop them on there. Like I took all my points from my, under drivers, I have the onboard I.O. with all the points. So I just took all the inputs, all the analog inputs. I could turn around and take my binary inputs and drop them on there as well. So any questions on the HMI part? Okay, so then the next piece of it is, if you look at the onboard, there's under drivers, we have our standard Niagara network, so you can bring in other Niagara devices. Uh, then I dropped on from the uh, CL onboard I.O. palette, the onboard I.O. network. This way you have access to your points that are built into the controller. So this one is a 26 IO device. In Europe, they have a, uh, I forget what it was, a 14 point, 20 point. They have another another flavor of IO mix on the smaller. But then we can go in and look at the points. And I just did a discover, and I just brought all the points in as one, you know, one in one uh, one pass. So these are all the points that are available in there, like on my. Analog inputs or my universal inputs. It's just like you've done in the past. Because it's European, everything's Celsius. So in order to get your 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 uh, temperatures, it'd be what temperatures, pressures, and uh, what's the third? Airflow, I guess. Meters per second. You have you have to go in and do the conversion. You can't just select uh, Celsius. In the workbench, it'll show up properly when you do the uh, units underneath your, uh, under tools and options, and you say I'm English or metric. If you do it that way, the points are still going to show up Celsius on your display. So the right way to do it is to choose Fahrenheit and do a linear conversion with 1.8 and the 32 degree offset, and your points get calculated properly from that. Now, I've seen that in the past on other other controllers have required it to be done that way as well. A little extra work. Yeah. That's why I bring it up, just for, you know, to make people aware of it. And you have your, if we look at our analog outputs, you get 0 to 10, 2 to 10. You set up your direct reverse acting from here. So no, no milliamp? Um, I thought, no, strictly voltage, no, no milliamp output. Good question. That's why I made that chart up, so I have a quick reference to it. But the analog output, you can go 0 to 11 volts, 1 milliamp max. So where that always came into play as an issue was, it was back in the days when you had pneumatic actuation and you had your uh, I to P transducers that if it was a 1 million type, you had to get the three-wire transducer because you needed separate power to power it. For some controllers, it was what? You had uh, 10 milliamps or whatever, 20 milliamps available. But in this case, it's only 1 milliamp. And you have your binary outputs. What's this player? Log output. Where's that? So what is what is the milliamp output rating of the spider? Well, a spider can go four to twenty can do a current output, so it must be twenty milliamps. If it can do a four to twenty or a voltage output, then I gotta believe it would be twenty. That's how I usually equate to whether it can do milliamp or not. Okay, good point. So 
on, on, a, on a DC output, uh, a voltage output, I'm wondering what the milliamp rating is on the spider. I, was thinking I know I can get three actuators on a single analog output. Okay. I was just wondering if how much gumption there is on this AO. Well, you get one milliamp max is all you get, so it's going to then be dependent on the, the actuators and what their right. draw is. I mean, worst case, you got to go, if you have multiple actuators, you, how you, what, you control one and then do the feedback out of that, right? You get your binary input settings. So it's, for the most part, standard type settings on there. The only real thing to watch out for, as I mentioned, is the uh, putting in that uh, the conversion for your analog inputs to make sure you get your right readings. I know if it's pressure, it's going to be in Pascal's, Pascal's and it's Pascal. 0.403, I think, is the multiplier for that. Um, but that is stuff I know that they have documented in the user manual, so that'll all be in there when it gets released. I mean, I'm going to, I plan on putting the, uh, the pre-release, I guess you could call it, that I have of the uh, Eagle Hawk user guide. I'll put that up there with everything else from today. So at least we have that as reference for now. Um, and once the final one comes out, I'll replace it with that. Any, any questions thus far? 822 module if you needed more. Okay. But as I mentioned, there are the two main modules that you need, the two main pallet uh, modules, the yellow on board and that uh, HON, uh, where'd it go? The HON um, Eagle Hawk HMI. Actually, CL on. And as I mentioned earlier, you still also have the ability to use the other central line um, uh, modules for doing control. You'll see they have different different types in here. Um, I'm not. I really haven't used them, so I don't have any working knowledge of, of, of using them. I know they have everything documented and everything's in the online help. I did check that, so okay. they're all, everything's there. I think a lot of this you'll see correspond to some of the, I guess they're the modals in, the modals in CARE and also the XFMs in CARE. I think where a lot of these came from. And as I mentioned, they're for the Eagle controllers, but they're also for any web space. These models will work. They're licensed for it, and it has to be a web, web's brand in order for that to actually function. So if you dropped one of these modules onto a Vicon Jace, it would yell at you? It, yeah, it wouldn't function. If that's how it's what I'm told. But would it allow it and just not function, or would it yell at you? I would think it's... Like if you use, you can't drop a kit control module into a spider wire sheet, for example. Well, if you're, I would think it's still going to be there. It's still going to let your station run. Just like if you don't have LonWorks uh, licensed, it'll come up and say it's not licensed, but the station still will run. It's just LonWorks won't work. Right. So it'll be like that. And I'm 99% sure it runs the same way because I remember when they first came out with the Eagle AX, we tried to use the central line modules with the web's Jace, and it didn't like it. And we were, you know, it took, it took almost four weeks to get, we got the okay within a couple of days that, that we can get it licensed. It took almost a month for Germany to do the licensing for it. Wow. So I think they realized they needed to make it available for all the web's branded products. So now it's, you know, built in. Um, but they were all the, main points that I wanted to touch on with the Eagle Hawk, um, the Cyper Model 50. With that, um, I open it up for any, any questions, comments, observations, anybody worked with these in the AX or if you can touch their 
the new model if they've started working with it. Any any comments so far would be great. I guess not. I see who has left here. Um, Jack, what do you think? A teacher calling on people. Uh, I, I like what I'm seeing. I'm uh, going to wait and let some other people have the uh, joy of trying them out first. I did remember hearing mention that there would be we'd be able to use our spider tool or spider tool programs. Is that for one of the, for the other snipers, perhaps? Yes, 30. That's the 30. That's the 30. Okay. Yeah, the spider tool is, is a feature that's part of the license, but that's to be able to program, program your spider spiders. controllers. Yeah. But it's the Cyper 30 that is is the one that's going to have the, uh, the ability to do Niagara and spider logic within the controller at one time. Okay. Uh, is there any, I'm, I'm assuming we're looking at, Four seven coming around the corner. Is there any timeline to get this thing kind of caught up? They're not up to four six yet with this. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of why I'm asking. It's like we're not up to four six, but I'm assuming four sevens should be coming around the corner for uh, Sunnywell folks. Uh, that should have. I think that really should have been around already. But no, I have not heard of any dates, even when just the standard 4.7 of webs is coming out. I mean, I, so I was supposed to. Have, base... I, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say because I know I was supposed to be getting a, a an early release of 4.8 this last month or this month. So you know they're moving ahead. There's a lot out there, but yeah, Honeywell still. There haven't been a release date for for four seven. That's been made known anyway. Hmm. Okay. So so we can we can basically engineer this thing in that version of four four and then put it on our four six four seven Niagara network. That's correct. Okay. I'm okay. I. The, do you see, I don't anticipate, but do you see any potential pitfalls for sharing data between JSONs of different revisions in N4? You know, like a, let's say a 4.6 JSON passing info to a Eagle Hawk at 4.4? No, I don't see any issues with that. I mean, if you're going to be using Niagara Network to discover Eagle Hawk points into another Niagara device, you're going to need those modules over there to be able to have it do a discover and, and work its way through. But um, I don't see that really being an issue. I mean, we do that already with other lower version Niagara devices. Yeah, as long as your supervisor is a higher version, you should be fine. Yeah, I'm thinking the other way around. Let's say I had a, a 4.7 or 4.6 JS on a job site and I needed to send some data from that into the Eagle. I mean, it's still a station platform. It's still a, a Niagara platform station like a supervisor would be, so I don't see where that would be any different. As long as it's the same version or higher, it should be able to work with it. Yeah. Okay. As long as they're just Niagara points, you, you should be fine. All right. Well, it, it looks exciting. So panel bus pallet? Panel bus pallet? Yeah. Uh, uh, this is the interesting one. Nothing on that yet. I'm just teasing right now. There's a C bus driver for this device too that I haven't, I don't know if it's released or not. Um, but the, I don't know what the name of it would be. Let's see. HON. Uh, Central line. Try CL. There it is, panel bus. And then you have your panel bus devices. 
So they're still using the central line part numbers for them. But it looks like it's still going to follow the similar the numbering, you know, universal inputs, you know, analog outputs. Where do they get tied into? You can take it. You can move it. That's fine. I have a camera on it. No, I don't have it up on the display. That's right. Would here. So it's going to be a the panel bus is going to be on the RS-485, either one of the ports. Hey, but is there a twisted pair? What do you mean? Oh, yeah, right here. Yeah. Okay, got it. Got it. That's the it. other thing I wanted to mention, too, I, I, I'm going to add to the slide so I didn't get a chance to. We talked about that LED for the alarming. There's an L1 and an L2 LED on there. L1 is that the daemons are loading. L2, which is one I really like, it's saying that the platforms are available to connect to. So they actually have an LED to tell you when it's okay to connect to the platform. That's nice. And then there's also a transmit oh, and receive cool. LED, just one pair. That's strictly for this. the first or RS-485 port. There are no and receive lights for the second RS-485 port. I'm not sure what the reasoning was behind that, but the same thing, I guess, with they only have one set of biasing uh, dip switches, and that was for the first port as well. So if there's, if, like I said, any more, if there's any more questions, we can we can talk further. If not, I can stop this recording. Um, the last call for any questions or comments. MVP.